Okay, so we're starting the installation of VMware ESXi. In this case, I'm running it inside VMware Workstation, so it's a little different. I've mounted the ISO as the media drive for that virtual machine, and I'm booting up from the media. But on a physical server, we would just do that directly from the boot media, or we could boot from the network. If you're using VMware Enterprise, you can use auto deploy to have machines that boot from the network every time. We can install ESXi onto a local hard drive. We could also use removable media such as SD or a typical flash card. We can also boot from the SAN if that's available for you as an option. Booting from the SAN is slightly more complicated because we're going to require fiber channel or if we're going to use iSCSI, we're going to need an iSCSI hardware initiator which provides a boot capability. The VMware software iSCSI initiator or the software fiber channel over ethernet adapter don't provide a boot capability because we need VMware installed and working in order to access that functionality. So if you want to do a boot from SAN, yes, it's possible. Again, in a large environment, that might be quite useful. Although we're still going to need to maintain an installation copy for each individual server, it may be easier to use auto deploy if you have an environment where this really is required and not have any media to maintain it all in those servers. Once the installer is loaded, then we have the option to cancel or continue, so nothing really to do here. Make sure that the environment you use is supported. If you review the VMware hardware compatibility guide, that's going to give you a pretty good indication that everything will work well and that your vendor has tested it and that VMware has certified that all the driver functionality is available. It's certainly possible to install other drivers. Depending on the hardware that you're using, it may well work, but there are no guarantees, so your safest course of action is to refer to hardware that's on the hardware compatibility guide or at least discuss the compatibility with the vendor and see if potentially there's been developments that weren't originally included in the hardware compatibility guide. At this point, I'll just press enter to continue. I'll review the license agreement carefully and review with my legal department to ensure that everything is appropriate. Once we've completed that, we can go ahead and press F11 to accept and continue. Now in this case, you can see that it's listing the local storage that's available inside my virtual machine, which will, in this case, host ESXi rather than Windows or Linux as it typically would. So I've got three local virtual hard drives effectively, but these could have been hardware RAID sets already configured on the server. I've got three local block storage devices. I have a 40 gig drive and then two 200 gig drives. But at this point, I have no remote storage, so you see it lists none for remote. And for local, there's nothing already set up on those machines. A lot of the names are listed as VMware here, simply because those are drives presented by VMware Workstation, in this case, to the ESXi environment. So in this case, I don't have anything already on those drives, but if I was reinstalling ESXi or if I was doing an upgrade, then I want to ensure that I don't affect any virtual machines that are already stored on those drives on a VMFS file system, which is VMware's native file system for ESX and now ESXi. We can only use VMFS effectively for storage of virtual machines on ESXi, at least for any block storage devices that were directly connected to or that were connected to via fiber channel or iSCSI. When you connect to storage presented by NFS, then it's different and we actually use the native file system of the remote NFS server, the network file server protocol that's used in Unix and Linux. We don't need to format it as VMFS. We just place the files associated with the virtual machines directly onto that remote file system. And the only protocol in use is NFS. There's no additional SCSI or any of the other normal IO activity that occurs on what VMware thinks is an actual hard drive. So in this case, I'm going to leave my two 200 gig partitions or my 200 gig virtual drives alone for the time being. I'm just going to select to install on the 40 gig partition. And the installation for ESXi is really not very large. So what I'm going to find is that part of that will be used as a Linux partition style for installing ESXi onto. And then the remainder of that 40 gig device is going to be created as a VMFS data store automatically. And then later I can go and format those additional 200 gig drives as VMFS data stores. Or I could even put multiple VMFS data stores or I could combine them into a single VMFS data store, and we'll discuss all that in a later video. For the time being, I'm just going to go ahead and press F1 to show you the details, and you'll see that it provides not very much more information, but if you were being presented with a lot of devices, 
in a very complex storage environment, particularly if there's many devices coming from the SAN and you're installing to a disk on the SAN, then it's going to be very important that we get it right. We can see a little bit more detail here and we can see whether there's an ESXi installation there. And we can also see whether there are any data stores recognized there. And that can also be very helpful to determine if you do want to overwrite something that you're referring to the right thing and you're not going to remove something that you didn't want to. Very simple, brand new environment. I'm just going to go ahead and press enter to continue. I'm just going to accept US default because none of the names or passwords or anything that I'm going to provide need accented characters. You do have to be careful with that though. If you do work in a mixed language environment, a password might be different entered on a Canadian French keyboard, for example, which is very common, or an American or other keyboard layout as well. So this is something that you're going to want to standardize in your environment. But here, I'll just go ahead with US. And I'm just going to set my password as capital P at SSW0RD and then confirm that password and press enter. Now there's not a lot that happens from this point in the installation. We're going to do most of our configuration after the fact. It's listing us the drives in terms of the host bus adapter as well as the controller number, target number, and LUN number. So I'm just going to go ahead and press F11 to continue the install from here. And then it pretty much goes. There's not a lot that has to happen, and most of our configuration, as I mentioned, will be done after the fact using the vSphere client. At this point, ESXi is installed. We're operating in evaluation mode, and we can go in and enter a license later through the client. And there's nothing to do at this point except go ahead and reboot and then see how it comes up for the first time. So as it goes to boot, you'll see there's a few options we can change here for recovery mode and editing the boot options. We'll take a look at that later on in the video. So at this point, we can see it's a lot like the installer loading. Using Alt F12, we can actually see the boot log here, and this will be very helpful in determining if there's any driver initialization problems, if there's any problems with the network configuration, or if any interfaces won't come up. This is a little bit detailed. There's other ways that we can review this later. You'll notice there is a bit of a help feature, and we do have some interactive functionality that we can use to review the log. There's not a lot, really. But you'll notice as well a couple of other keystrokes mentioned here, Alt F1, Alt F2, and Alt F11. So you'll see that we have a little bit of a console view here, which might be a bit easier to read and gives us messages as various services come up. There's nothing really on the Alt F2 console, but if we wait around here long enough, something might appear. And if we go to Alt F11, we're back at our original screen. Okay, so at this point, we're now up and running to some extent. We've got a dynamically assigned address, at least a dynamically assigned IPv4 address. IPv6 has a static address that I didn't assign it. In IPv6, automatic addressing for stations is automatic. We could control it using DHCP v6, but we don't need to do that. And in this case, it really doesn't matter very much to me at all what my IPv6 address is. If I want to change this address, I'm going to do that through either this interface or later on I can change it remotely using the client. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how to access the local DCUI interface to configure ESXi and take a look at a couple of other things that we can do with ESXi shell and some of the troubleshooting options available to us.